As the Taliban take over Afghanistan, what is the fate of Africa, many ask, more specifically, Nigeria? And the revelation that former governor of the CBN, Sanusi Lamido Sanusi, made indicts the APC and vindicates us, says the PDP. But well, we're going to find out what that is on Plus Politics. I am Mary Anna Cohen. In less than 10 days after the United States withdrew its forces from Afghanistan, the country fell into the hands of the Taliban. The country had been ruled by the Taliban from 1996 to 2001, when the United States and Allied forces invaded Afghanistan, aiming to stop the Taliban from using Afghanistan as a base of operations for terrorist activities. So now putting in consideration the security issues Nigeria and other African countries such as Kenya, Mali, uh, are facing could this international incident what would it mean for africa well joining us to discuss this is agogo obo he's a foreign affairs expert farai Movuti is a senior analyst at the southern african times and we have joining us from the united states justin higgins a former u.s policy advisor thank you very much gentlemen for joining us thank you for having me great I'm, I'm going to start with you, Justin, because um, obviously many have been asking questions as to um, if it was very timely uh, or if it was, you know, not the right time for the U.S. to pull out its forces uh, from Afghanistan, looking at what's happened over, uh, you know, the, the past couple of days. So, um, and I, I know, I remember um, in 2009, if I'm not mistaken, when the president now used to be vice president, he somewhat did not agree with sending more people, more soldiers to Afghanistan at the time. Um, so the question is, could that have been the reason why he pulled out now? Well, President Biden, for at least a decade, has been against the continued operations going on in Afghanistan. So for at least the last 10 years, he has been pretty consistent, like you mentioned. But here in the U.S., just to give everybody a feel of the strong criticism that the president is facing from both parties, from Republicans and Democrats, it's not so much that Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. It's the fact that we have a 10 to 15,000 U.S. citizens stuck in Afghanistan right now. And in addition to that, anywhere from 80 to over 100,000 Afghan translators, contractors, and people that we promised to get out and into safety after we evacuated. So it's not so much that the country fell to the Taliban, which is a point of criticism, but it's the fact that President Biden had seven months to get these people out of Afghanistan and into safety, and he was not able to do so. Hmm. It's interesting. Now, we also obviously have a humanitarian issue um, with Afghanistan because we're seeing more and more people trying to get out uh, of Afghanistan. And most of them obviously will become a problem to the countries that border around them. But let's talk, talk about the politics of it. Um, can people, is it right for people to blame the U.S. for pulling out um, at this time? And the fact that the Taliban have taken over, uh, again, where will all of these people go knowing that the world as it is is facing the biggest pandemic it has ever faced, ever? Um, it, I mean, is this not going to be a problem for countries that have to take these refugees in? Well, we spent two decades and hundreds of billions of dollars uh, on a mission that originally was focused on eliminating al-Qaeda and terrorism in the country. And it became very apparent, many experts think over a decade ago, that the, there was not going to be the ability for the U.S. and coalition forces to create a stable Afghanistan. So from a domestic perspective, 
from the way that many people in the U.S. are looking at this, a recent poll showed 66% of Americans did not think the war was justified. So politically speaking, uh, the, there's a strong consensus that Joe Biden was right to pull out the troops from Afghanistan, that whether we stayed for another year or five years, it wouldn't have made a difference in the stability of the government. And that at the end of the day, we had been there for way too long and it was time to bring our daughters and sons home. All right, I'll come back to you because there's a lot more to talk about in terms of the policies um, going forward. But let me come to you, Farai. Um, for Africa, uh, there seems to be a, a lot of talk going on behind the scenes. I, I know that Uganda is to take in uh, about 2,000 of these Afghan refugees, and um, this is because they're doing it at the request of the U.S. Uh, but for African countries, aside from Uganda, who are facing... Um, terrorism like Mozambique is the latest uh, on that list and I think a few days ago uh, there was another hit um, by jihadist in um, if I'm not mistaken another African country I, you know I can't remember um, what does this mean for Africa because we're seeing Uganda taking in refugees but for those fighting insurgency what does this Afghanistan situation um, spell for African countries um, well, yet again, thank you for having me. I think with Africa, we have a different context altogether. If you look at, for example, Mozambique, or even um, the current challenges of insurgency that you're facing in Nigeria, these are very particular circumstances that are very unique and intrinsically different to what uh, Afghanistan uh, would have, the case with Afghanistan, for instance. The, uh, the Taliban is a homegrown group that is not external from the cultural realities of that particular country. Uh, as the, the recent president, or rather I'll, I'll use the example of uh, uh, the, the head of the military here in the UK, who described them as homeboys or cowboys, who are basically locals within their own, uh, within their own terrain, uh, who, who, who struggle, uh, in, in, in most of just people would read it, as a fundamentally local struggle. In, in instances of insurgency, these are implanted uh, projects that may be an extension, collaborating though with locals, but, but inherently a state structure still exists and there is no external intervention, in this, which is not, which is the case, which was of course the case of Afghanistan. What you might, what Africa may be looking at, however, is how it, 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 it plays a role in that particular instance. So Uganda, as you've so stated, will be looking into taking, uh, taking in about 2,000 of those refugees to create uh, to, to support uh, the outcome and the, the process of ensuring that uh, the humanitarian aspect of uh, the Afghans, uh, of the Afghans who are actually traveling out, they can be met as part of their global contribution, which demonstrates that Africa is a part of the global conversation through, of course, Uganda, and there might be more of that. But in a political sense, there is a deeper argument that is currently brewing about democracy itself, the notion that liberal democracy in, 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 its, in its fixture or understanding or by virtue of its ideology, uh, in, uh, can, can it be transplanted? This is, a, a, this is a new conversation that you're finding. So it, it's boosting the argument that perhaps countries like Rwanda are making, whose democracies are, speak to their own realities and their own cultural and historical background. Uh, you, the president of Nigeria, President Mohamed Buhari, um, sp uh, I think he put out um, a report on the Financial Times and he talked about the fact that Africa needs to look within to be able to deal with its issues of terrorism. But he also said that um, Africa seems to be the new front line for global militancy, saying that Afghanistan's uprising came uh, as an un unexpected momentum. Now, he fears that if Africa does not begin to look for African ways to deal with this issue, we might be facing an Afghanistan you know, situation, just like what we're seeing playing out today. Um, but how true is it? And, and looking at African countries, because I'm gonna ask my next guest the same question. Are African countries finding African ways to deal with the issue of terrorism, or do we still keep going cap in hand to the US or for those who are Francophone countries, go to the French? Um, for support, and how well has that worked out? Well, I think there is truth in what, uh, what uh, the president is saying. However, I, I think it will be largely exaggerated to suggest that we would face an Afghanistan scenario, because these, these are completely different circumstances, as I said before. However, the non-collaborative uh, approach to dealing with uh, terrorism in certain instances or insurgencies can be 
uh, can influence uh, a, 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 a growth of that. So to that degree, to the extent of that argument, yes, I do agree. Uh, but we are seeing quite a number of collaborations. Uh, SADC, for example, the Southern, the, the Southern African Development Region has collaborated with Mozambique. We've even seen the extended help of uh, Rwanda. In Nigeria's case, there is a regional approach to looking at it, of course, in terms of uh, boots on the ground, that has not become the reality. But this is purely down to uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, it has not been interacted with Nigeria has tended to be able to have this on, or rather said on the, in regional bodies that it's been able to handle this on security concerns. So I think in, a, in as much as I do understand his argument, I think E2 as head of state can push that through regional bodies and equally continental bodies. There is, there is a thirst to make that happen. Um, and can do they have the power to do so? I think Nigeria in the largest economy in the continent has a lot of sway and what happens in the, in the AU. So it can be empowered through its own model as well. Just joined us. So let me take this question to Agogo. Agogo, um, it's very interesting that our president is the one who's expressing the, the most fear as a result of what he's seen play out in Afghanistan. And um, uh, when the president says this, it seems more like he's preaching to the choir because really... Have we really had a Nigerian approach to dealing with the terrorism that we're facing in the country today? Um, looking at the fact that we have a hydra-headed sort of uh, terrorist activity going on in the country under different nomenclatures, um, is the president really expressing fear for Nigeria or just expressing a general fear for Africa, noting what's happening in the Sahel? Agoga, I don't think we can hear you. Um, maybe you have to lose the headphone. Works. Great, Is we it can better hear you now? now. Yes, we can hear you now. All right. All right. So I, I think that um, he, he speaks for he speaks for the generality of um, of West Africans, you know, who unfortunately have um, bore the brunt of uh, Boko Haram since two thousand and nine. And then um, ISWAP, which has um, taken over from Boko Haram uh, recently also, too. And then you have um, the farmer headers crisis. There are known gunmen who have now become uh, what we call the Fulani headsmen in this part of um, the world. So when, when he speaks this way, he's talking about a problem which has been with us for over 11 years and has led to the loss of lives in several uh, tens of thousands and the millions of people who are displaced. And you... Uh, make a great point in the way people have analyzed the government's approach in resolving first the Boko Haram uh, terror incidents and um, what is going on with the farmers and then the headers uh, crisis, which has now become number one uh, compared to Boko Haram, where you've seen in recent days uh, numbers of people who've surrendered and are no longer willing to fight or take up arms against the government. But, the question you probably will ask is um, what's happening with the states? Most of the northwestern states where you're having the crisis happen, the abductions, the kidnappings, the killings, um, they, they are states that um, have uh, the biggest developmental problems and indices. If you trace back, you'll find out that many of those problems that heralded the Boko Haram crisis, some of the problems you're seeing being faced by many states in the northwest and the north central. So. The governors are asking for soldiers, they're asking for weapons, they're asking for everything. But the development which has thrown their states into crisis, they don't have enough food, they don't have water, they don't have housing, they have a large number of children who are out of school. So on the one hand, there's the military option in which a number of the governors have assumed to be their approach in resolving the crisis. But the other approach is, which is in getting those developmental uh, indicators up to the point where we can then argue that because you have less children who are, no, who are, who are out of school or who have access to health care or have access to, an employ to employment, then, then you're ready to fight this war. Otherwise, um, you just be blowing in the wind. Um, again, my question, um, just to go push you further, the Katsina state governor, the governor of the state where our president is from, recently asked that... Um, the people in the state resort to self-help, which again makes me um, look at Mr. President's message on the Financial Times and wonder really if the president is talking about us here because he lives here, he lives in this country, he sees everything that's been happening. 
have, have we done all that needs to be done by the book for us to begin to decide if we can resort to self-help? And when governors begin to speak from different sides of their mouth and the military is also on the other side, you know, trying to see what they can do as per damage control, does this not make it look like we're in some form of a chaos or a chaotic situation? This, this is the case of the ostrich um, hiding its, its head in the desert and it's rump outside. If you ask all of those states, there's no state in Nigeria that gets security votes less than 200 million naira. No state gets security vote every month less than 200 million naira. The richest states get about 800, 900 million naira. There is no plan for any, by any of those governors saying that those monies which have been put for their security, which interestingly, if you put those monies into education, you put those monies into healthcare on a monthly basis, you probably will be, you probably will be dealing with the problem squarely. The president doesn't allude to um, a hidden fact, but which, is, which is public knowledge. The, the, in Nigeria, the states that have the highest uh, uh, population growth rate are located where you have the banditry and the terrorism going on in the Northwest, in Katsina, they've got one of the highest um, uh, 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 birth rates. And interestingly, you also have one of the worst malnutrition rates you also have, according to the government's um, uh, uh, data uh, warehouse. So the, 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 what, what did the, the governor's asking people to take off arms to fight against what? Uh, for the Minister of Defense, I, I think it was Magashi also a couple of months ago, had also asked them, to take up arms, people who carry carry light weapons, RPGs and um, uh, G, G, uh, uh, GPMGs, as light weapons. What do you expect um, local vigilante to do? They have no way in going in going out against these people and expecting anything short of simply being annihilated. So, um, political many people have said, but in the real sense of it, there's a lot more that still needs to be done. He's asking for investment, but the question is, if you're asking for investment in these places. What, what have the states done, um, you know, to, to show some transparency in how those states are run? Plato, Plato State, which is, which is the North Central, I heard the governor uh, through his commission of information this morning say, people accuse the governor of sleeping, but he says the local council officials have able sleeping and snoring far more than the executive. But the question you should ask, uh, people have asked that they ask all of the state governors is, what have they done to free up the local space? There is no state in Nigeria where you don't have the, the, the governors superimposing and taking control over what happens at local government areas. So on the one hand, there is no government at the local government level because the state governors, like emperors, are sitting on and breathing on their necks. It, it, it looks like a very, very uh, tough situation. But let me go back to Justin. Um, Justin, it's... It's um, very easy for Nigerians to quickly go to or say to the U.S., we need you to help us at every point, whether it's with the NSAS, whether it's with terrorism and, and, and any other thing, we always go to the U.S. or the U.K. to help us in this fight. Now, um, with what's happened in Afghanistan, can we say that maybe the U.S. was tired of fighting or that the U.S. saw that, you know, the, this war could not be won? And, and then... Now that we in, in Africa are looking also to the West for help, should we jettison that hope that the West can help us to fight terrorism and, like my president say, begin to look inwards? Well, I'm going to agree with what Farai said, or at least I thought he said, which is Afghanistan is a completely, completely different story and set of facts and circumstances than the terrorism in Nigeria and really Western or U.S. involvement in a lot of different um, African nations. That's because of a simple fact. In Afghanistan, it wasn't that we were tired of fighting. It was that the United States mission was twofold. It was one, to fight terrorism, and two, it eventually became, after a decade or so, to build a government. We got tired of the fact that the second part was never going to happen. In Nigeria, we're not assisting Nigeria by building a government. We are simply assisting Nigeria with fighting terrorism. So it's a completely different story. And then the other thing I'll say here is this. If there's any lesson to be taken from any government in Africa, the Nigerian government, any of them, it is that cutting down on corruption and increasing on transparency is the best way to get full and robust support from the United States.
We all know, I mean, you and I had this conversation a few weeks ago, if not months, uh, maybe last month, when we talked about the fact that um, the U.S. Uh, Congress or the Senate um, had put a pause on the sales of some Pfizer jets to Nigeria because of humanitarian issues. Now, we're in the middle of a, an unconventional war, and we're also having to deal with the fear of the fact that these terrorists continue to come down to this part of the, the, the continent, uh, and then the gun running around the Sahel, it's a big deal. Uh, how do we fight insurgency? How do we deal with terrorism when we do not have what we need to fight it? Yes, we know that humanitarian issues are dangling over our heads, but what do we do? Which do we choose over which? Well, I think you can choose both, right? If you have strong diplomats and a president who actually wants to get these tools to help fight and defeat the terrorists, then you sit down at the table with the United States negotiators and you come up with a path forward. This is just a temporary hold, as I mentioned earlier, by a few different senators. So if there is a plan put in place that the U.S. Senate, that the U.S. State Department feels confident about, and what does that mean? A plan in place that the U.S. diplomats and the U.S. legislators can feel confident that these weapons will not be used like weapons were used in the NSARS protests to gun down innocent protesters and commit atrocities, then it's very likely that these weapons, the hold will be removed and that they will be sold to the Nigerian government to defeat terrorism. There just has to be some simple steps made by the government to show that they are willing partners. What should what lessons should Africa um, be learning from this Afghanistan issue, especially um, with the, the you know the the situation in Mozambique today, and of course uh, Kenya is also dealing with uh, the issue of Al Shabaab, and I mean the list is endless. If we start calling the names of the countries that are dealing actively with in, uh, insurgents and these. ISWAP, now they call them ISWAP, some of them are called ISIS. What should Africa be learning now? Just as my president said, should we look for Mozambican ways to deal with Mozambique's problems? Can we look for other ways in Kenya to deal with Kenya's insurgency? What exactly should we be doing, Farai? Uh, well, thank you. I, I think um, the solutions are to be homegrown. Uh, we have to do. We have to look at it from a, a, a two uh, two prong, prong, uh, 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 position. We have to we have to deal with the economic uh, realities uh, that that create the conditions in which uh, from which uh, so, so these groups can gain local support. Uh, so dealing with the, the economic, of course, is critically important. So strengthening institutions to ensure that we can widen the distribution of uh, of uh, of uh, wealth. But secondly, the security, of, of course, has a major role to play in this. And there needs to be a coordinated approach to looking at how security is dealt with. So, the, so Mozambique, for example, is, is, is quite a good, uh, good, uh, good way to look at it. They've been able to slowly deal with their, the, 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 the insurgency because of a joint coalition of militaries that are African-based. Okay, And you do have, of course, the involvement of the United States and the Portuguese, but only in a training capacity and equally supporting financially, to, uh, providing financial support uh, to the Mozambican government. Right? But that support has to be purely on that basis. But the, hard, the boots on the ground, the hard work has to be done by African militaries. And so far we have militaries such as Zimbabwe that have quite extensive experience within the Mozambique terrain. You have Angola now currently going in. You have South Africa launched into the deep of Mozambique. African solutions are, are, are best because they not only have the experience to deal with, with that and they understand the local realities by virtue of culture, but they equally speak the language. Okay, so the, the com community language as well. So all these things matter. So a, a homegrown based solution is, is the best way forward. Nigeria, for, for example, within the Western region, they, they is a, a strong coalition that can be created equally through the aid of the AU. But the, the, these things have to be looked at. So in one thing, I do agree with the president when he argues for homegrown solutions. I differ when he uses Afghanistan as a critical example of that reality, purely on the basis of the, of the differences of history, uh, culture, and context.
All right, I'll go, go. I'm going to wrap up with you. Um, going forward, because, I mean, everybody seems to be sounding the same. We need to deal with corruption, Justin says. Um, Farai says, let's do deal with, uh, let's have homegrown security and fight against uh, the terrorists. Um, but in Nigeria, like you have said, we have issues of corruption, and now we have humanitarian issues dangling over our head. And we have so many needs that have to be met. The, the, the welfare of the soldiers who are at the forefront, um, the fact that we are welcoming so-called repentant Boko Haram members and we have rehabilitated such before and some of these people returned back as informants uh, to the Boko Haram people. So again, really, that saying of once twice big, um, once, once bitten, twice shy, uh, does it, shouldn't it apply here? And, and when we talk about debriefing these guys and actually finding out why they returned, um, shouldn't due diligence be done so that we avoid having the same problem crop up over and over again in closing? Mm. Mm. You know, at, at the height of um, the Boko Haram um, crisis, when, when former president, good luck, Jonathan, was leading, uh, there was a rough estimate about how many Boko Haram trained fighters they had. It was about 6,000. But if you calculate the numbers of Boko Haram terrorists that have been killed with a number of uh, press statements you get from the military on a weekly basis. So I exceed that. So the question you should probably be asking is, where, where, where are those numbers coming from? So it's the same deplorable situation that the local governments and the states over the years still exist today. One of the reasons why you're having a large number of Boko Haram, uh, I don't like to even use the word repentant because this one is so in an ideology. It's uh, a matter of conjecture how repentant you can really say that uh, uh, that person is. It's, it's either he's dead on the side of a terrorist and alive on the side of those who are not terrorists. And at the end of the day, he still um, he still got um, uh, 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 he still got a cross on his back. So those conditions that made it fatal for them to join uh, Boko Haram or Iswab are those conditions still existing today? The answer is yes. You don't have schools. You don't have hospitals in those places. You don't have the employment so you need. A lot of investment in all of these places to get them, uh, get them on board. Um, many of those fighters, um, they, they, you also will have to do a reconciliation of some sort. And reconciliation comes with social justice. Um, how many of them have committed crimes that are against humanity, war crimes, and those sort of crimes uh, that should be punished for what they've, they've done? That way, the people in those communities will be willing to accept them back because already there's a lot of anger towards these people and they don't want them uh, back again. So those are things I think people uh, are talking about and want that to happen as quickly as possible so you don't have what happened in the Northeast repeat itself in the Northwest where you have a large number of people who aren't going to school. So um, those are things that we expect to see going forward. All right. Well, I want to say thank you. Justin Higgins is a former U.S. Uh, policy advisor. Um, Farai Mabuti is a senior analyst, Southern African, the Southern African Times. Anna Gogo Obo is a foreign affairs expert. Thank you, gentlemen, for a very interesting conversation. I appreciate it. Thank you, Marianne. All right. Thank you all. Well, uh, thank you for staying with us. We'll take a short break. And when we return, the People's Democratic Party tells us its thoughts about the statements from the former Central Bank of Nigeria, Governor Sanusi. Stay with us.